everybody. I'm Melissa Fung, um, and I'm just thrilled to be able to be here and uh, start the discussion with Paisley Medley. Um, and tell her, um, congratulations on the film. I think we all can agree it was very powerful and um, raised such awareness of a topic that not, you know, is pretty much unspoken most of the time. Um, so how I'll start with you. What motivated you to make this film? Um, well, I was born in the Islamic Republic of Iran, you know, a country where every aspect of your life is controlled by a strict notion of honor, politically, religiously, socially. A country where a woman, if you have, as a woman, if you have sex outside of marriage, it's punishable by death. Where I was forced to wear the hijab from the age of six, where as a woman you can't divorce your husband, and in very rare situations where you are able to, you have no custody of your children. Um, I grew up in a place where a mother, my own mother, told me that as a girl, you're like a tissue. Once you're used, i.e. you lose your virginity, you become useless, you become worthless. And I grew up hearing about virginity and the price you pay if you lost your virginity as a girl before even knowing what sex was. And I thought that I would be leaving these behind when at the age of 12 I escaped Iran and started living in refugee camps because I thought these things only happen in Iran. But then when I lived in a refugee camp, I lived with people from, Pakistan, from all over the world, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe, um, various African countries. And I realized that this happens all over the place. Honor abuse and pressures on girls to stay pure is not restricted to a geographical location. And in the camp, um, inside of Iran, these, these pressures were endorsed by the state. But in the camp, nobody was, there was no authority forcing them um, on anyone. But then they were happening, um, the, the people themselves were putting those pressures on their daughters. When we finally came to the UK when I was around 15, I thought, okay, finally, we're moving to a country that has a reputation for its tolerance. Um, and surely I'm leaving these ideas behind now. Boy, was I wrong. I went to a school and I remember girls from my school being subjected to various forms of unabased violence and abuse from their families. The same things I saw growing up in Iran and it absolutely shocked me. I remember Fatima, a girl that you know, it was so cool. I loved her. She would come to school and, you know, she would have to wear the hijab when she, wear, when she left her house in the morning. But then she would take it off when she got to school because she didn't want to wear it. And then she'd play football. And then she got abducted um, to Pakistan. And I saw her a few years later pushing a pram. And when I saw her on the street, she cried. You know, we were 15 when she disappeared from school. And she told me that her parents took her back to Pakistan and forced her to marry her cousin her distant cousin, a man twice her age, she had never seen. So I grew up seeing these pressures on women with virginity on top of those pressures. And it always made me want to do something about it because even though we might not hear about it often, these issues exist and they are so widespread. I sat down with my mom many years later and I was like, mom, why, why the hell did you tell me that as a girl, my value was basically my virginity defined my value why did you tell me i was like a tissue did, did you know that that made me feel so worthless and what she said to me really surprised me she said i didn't believe what i was preaching i was only trying to protect you by telling you the rules of the society we lived in i only wanted you to thrive forget thriving survive in that community in that society and the fact that my mom ended up coming in my film and she did all the undercovers, by the way. Um, she, worked, she did all of the undercovers and she actually helped us expose what's happening. The fact that my mom, the person who many years ago sat me down and told me, you have to protect your virginity, otherwise you're like a tissue, you become worthless. The fact that she did that goes to show that if women, if people have the opportunity to basically grow and have... To, to be in a society where they, can, where they have rights, 
they can do that. How hard is it, Peggy, to raise these issues outside of where you're from? I mean, you know, Sahar's from Iran, you're Kurdish, you know, you are both in the UK. How difficult is it to raise these issues? Because mostly, you know, society here doesn't, it's so foreign in a way to, to you know, how the British think about it. I'm from Canada and I covered an honor killing um, a Pakistani family, you know, a, a father who kills both of his daughters by running their car into a river. And, and, and the outcry in that country was, well, let that, that's their community. Let them deal with it, you know? So how, how do you fight that to try to raise awareness? Um, I think it's an issue that is obviously widespread. It's not just happening here or as you've discussed in Iran. But I think the problem is that it's one of those things that people think it's not happening and people don't want to talk about it. I mean, not just virginity, but women's health. I mean, personally, I, you know, I was never educated about my, you know, my body and, and my rights and sexual health. And so it's a conversation that almost feels like, you know, really, really hard to open up and people just are not talking about it, even though it's something that's happening. Um, Personally, my own community to talk about this idea of virginity, it's very shameful. It's almost like you're talking about, you know, condoning some type of um, uh, sexual sort of, uh, you know, um, freedom. And, and obviously for women and girls, that's seen as something very, very bad. So it is really difficult, but I think it's a conversation that needs to happen, not just in my community, but every community. There seems to be an obsession with um, you know, virginity and women's bodies, and I think it's part of that whole conversation where, you know, women's bodies and their virginity, their choices are not controlled. That's what all of this comes down to, and the, the pillars of virginity testing and hymenoplasty. It's all about controlling women and the choices that they make and, you know, who they want to, to be with. So, um, like I say, it's, it's a conversation that just needs to happen. It's not happening currently, but it needs to be happening. How hard is it to start that conversation, especially in your communities? I mean, you both live in the communities, so it can't be easy. The subject is so sensitive. I mean, actually, I don't live within that community. You, in Iran, we have a saying, it goes something like this. It says, um, if you don't want to um, basically become a victim, become the same color as the environment you're in and you know we left Iran but there are all these communities here where if you want to thrive you have to live within them and it's not as easy to say you know I, I'll do my own things and I'll, I'll you can't pick and choose you have to follow every single rule within those communities and um, if you don't want to do those you have to be completely separated I was lucky that my parents were so open-minded and you know, I, I had the chance to be myself and to, to make my own choices and I wasn't within that community. But for you, for example, you didn't have that um, luxury and I, it shouldn't be a luxury, but the fact that there are so many, just because we don't hear about them doesn't mean they don't exist. There are so many girls in this country, a country known for its tolerance, that are in horrendous situations. I mean, on average, 12 people, mostly women, get killed in honor killings every year in the UK. Think about it. Here, in this land, every year, 12 women and girls get killed in the name of honor, in the name of protecting the reputation of a family and community. You can't pick and choose. You can't, otherwise, you have to move away from that community. I mean, you can say, you can talk so much more about that. I think for me, um, of course, the conversations are really difficult to open up in my community, but one thing I try to do, I'm trying to do actively, is to start those conversations because I want to celebrate the good things, you know, about where I'm from and my community, and I haven't completely left my community. I'm trying to drive change and I'm trying to engage young people in these conversations. Um, as someone who has been personally impacted by the issues that we're talking about, from a personal experience, I always try and share, you know, the impact it's had on me to try and get people to talk about this and to try to start those conversations. And we've seen, um, we started a campaign called Virginity Does Not Define Me. I feel like we're still there. Um, we started a campaign at ICRO, and it was really to 
talk about the harms of virginity testing and to really get to the root of this problem and all of the myths that you hear about virginity and you know just really debunking those myths and harmful um, you know stereotypes that, that go in that conversation so I'm really trying to be that change and drive that change in my community and it, it's not easy because I know that for people for example who've responded to our social media campaign some people want to endorse it and they want to talk about it but they know that it's not a topic that you can just throw out there and you can start talking about but I believe you know change takes time and it's those small steps that you need to take in order to start that conversation so we're trying and I'd like to add to that as well um, change like Pacey very rightly pointed out doesn't come overnight you can't change you know my film as you know actually influenced and um, Ike Rowe and many other charities' contribution and hard work for years ended up having virginity testing and hymenoplasty banned. But that is just the first step. It's a very important and big step, but it's just a step. And real change, changing people's hearts, beliefs, souls, it takes a long time and you have to keep having those conversations. And you know, the fact that we're having this conversation today is one of those steps. The fact that you guys turned up today is one of those steps. The hard work that you do with ICRO and charities alike, they are all a part of that long-term process of having that conversation within communities. Me as a journalist, I make my films and I report and I move on and I try to remove myself from those communities. But you've, you're so brave because you've made it your mission to actually use your traumatic experiences to actually change that by you know doing the things that you just pointed out and you've been successful because now we do see a ban and that's a, that's a good segue journalists love segues right um you know the fact that there is a ban now and it's being legislated in this country great success to the advocates like you but you mentioned this in the film, um, is there a concern that that will move underground, that we'll see, you know, um, you know, less reputable people try to do hymenoplasties, sort of, and that will kick it underground? I think there's um, this, this sort of concern with anything that gets banned, and you have to look at it as this is bringing the topic out there and this is having people talk about it. So you might have that concern, but actually the impact that the ban is going to have, you know, the education, the awareness behind it, the training for professionals, is, is part of a whole holistic approach. As Sahar was saying, the ban is one thing, and then with that, we want to ensure that young people are talking about this, young people are aware of their rights and know that this shouldn't be happening. We want professionals to pick up on this, and we want this to really drive a change in society because this isn't just my community and your community, this is a general thing that, you know, as I said, society is just obsessed with. So I don't, personally, I don't believe that it will drive it under. I do believe that sometimes when things are banned, people will still, you know, like we see people committing crime. A lot of things are crime. We still see, unfortunately, people committing those crimes. But having a law, a clear law, is the backbone to having any change because it says in black and white, this should not be happening, and then you have everything else around it. And I, sorry, just to add to that as well, I mean with FGM for example, you, you mentioned crime, but like why go a far away? FGM was banned ages ago, but it's still happening today, and there's been hardly any prosecutions um, towards that. But then, like you said, what it does, what a ban does, it one, it makes it black and white, so that you can actually start prosecuting people and young women become aware of their rights and also there was a case of um, an Iranian young woman actually called Sophia Safarai who I desperately tried to bring into my film but then she, she didn't want to talk about it. Her parents tried to make her have a virginity test that um, she said to the GP that she didn't want to, the GP told her to go to the police she went to the police, she took her parents, so I'm so proud of her for doing that. She ended up taking her parents to the court. She actually said to them that, she um, said to the court with her lawyers that her parents tried to have her virginity tested, but then her parents weren't prosecuted. Why? Because there wasn't a law, because they hadn't broken a law. And that's what a ban does. It's, it's a starting point. 
think, it's sorry, just, just to add to that, I think it's also prevention. So obviously there are prosecutions, but sometimes not having those prosecutions means that you're preventing it from actually getting that far and from it happening. So it's a positive thing all in all, definitely. Yes. I think what struck me was that the, um, the woman at Freedom Charity um, said that the groom's families are asking for more. There's been a, a huge increase since the pandemic of, of groom's families really demanding this. And so with that demand, and now the fact that it's banned, you know, that's why you know, I pose that question is, is you know, how much concern there is that this will keep happening. You know, it, it, do you think that the ban will do anything to bring down the demand? I guess is the question. The thing is, she. This is news to many people here, but it's not really for many people. I mean, the the white sheet blood on white sheet practice has been there for centuries, and it's not really a new trend. It's just the clinics in open daylight legally producing certificates to say yes, this person is a virgin is just a convenience and that was that's what was becoming a trend so now by having the ban at least they know that they can't be asking for that because they're actually um, attempting and uh, they're actually committing a criminal offense and also if the professionals are not practicing this then even if there is a demand it's not happening so i do believe that the ban will definitely have a positive impact yeah so then let's talk about prosecution, right? One thing is to make it illegal. You know, what would you like to see in terms of penalties and prosecution? Well, I'm not an expert on these. Um, I just, honestly, I don't know much about, you know, how, how much somebody should be penalized for something like that. To me, I, I personally really, really believe in before things get that far, and it's about education and awareness on the topic. If, of course, somebody is, um, you know, a perpetrator is advocating for a girl to have virginity testing and is forcing a girl to go through that, I do believe they should face a penalty. I don't know how much, um, but they should definitely face a penalty. Um, but I, I really strongly am an advocate for all of that not happening and just prevention, you know, these conversations, men being involved in these conversations and really understanding the men who demand this, understanding the traumatic impact this has on women. It's really invasive and, you know, you, you would have heard from the women in this film and from my own personal experience, no woman should have to prove that she's a virgin or have to go through a procedure that will leave them with a really long lasting impact. You know, their body is being used to prove something, to uphold some sort of honor, to make somebody else feel better. And, um, you know, the, the thing is about this idea of virginity and the importance of it, it's something that you are told you carry and that you have to look after, although there is so much shame attached to it. And it's your body that you're asked to, you know, really, really treasure and to, um, as you said, keep pure. But then actually, it's treated as though it belongs to someone else. So the whole thing is so abusive and so intrusive of a woman's you know, body and what belongs to you and your rights. And just in brackets as well, um, virginity testing or hymenoplasty isn't the absolute worst thing that could happen. This film for me, and when I first pitched it to ITV's commissioner, Tom Giles, who just got it and understood the importance of this story, it wasn't about having your virginity tested or your hymen reconstructed. It was about unabased violence and abuse. And this is just a very small part of it. And when unabased abuse exists, virginity testing, hymenoplasty, and all these things are just a part of it. When one of them is there, it's followed by forced marriage, it's followed by domestic violence, it's followed by so many horrible things that happen to so many women. And that's why it's important to not just see this small thing as a criminal offence. I mean, ICRA has been campaigning to have um, child yeah. marriage banned for ages, and that's a part of honour-based violence. And we need to remember that these things don't come in isolation. So you had some men in the piece who were very forward-looking. Um, the imam, is he, are they unusual in, in this, in the community? I don't want to say the community because I'm, I, I you know, I, by, say, by using that term, I feel like I'm homogenizing it. I, I know it's not, but, but are, do you see that 
the leadership, male leaders, are coming to see the light a little bit? From my experience, and Imogen here, who um, was our um, assistant producer, and Erica, I mean, they can tell you, we had, we really struggled to have these people come in and speak. And the ones that did were progressive, but the problem is, they're not. They're not the these are traditional values, and, no, and those people are not the majority, and we really struggled to find the right people to come and speak. I mean, the, the voices that we wanted to come and speak because they, they just didn't want to because they knew that what they're saying is misogynistic. They knew what they're saying is against the grain of what our audiences... I, I don't know how to put this politically correct. But yeah, no. Um, from my experience, no. The, 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 there were so many... And also, it's not just the um, Muslim community either. We know that this is happening within the Hasidic Jewish community. We know that this is happening within the travelers community. None of them even wanted to help us uh, in any way, let alone entertain having a conversation with us. Um, I know that there will, are questions from the audience, so I will um, keep mine short. Um, what was the hardest part, the biggest challenge in making this film? For both of you. Do you want to go first? Um, I think for me it was sharing my personal experience. Um, it was probably one of the first times that I really publicly spoke about my own personal experience of a form of virginity testing. Um, so that was probably quite a difficult thing for me to do. But at the same time, I'm glad that I did it because I want to communicate and I want people to um, understand the harms that this causes to girls and women. And I also want girls and women that are impacted by this to know that it shouldn't be happening to them, even though the people around them may you know, force this on them and may communicate that this is the right thing and this is upholding honor. They need to know that this is wrong, this is invasive, and that there are people who can support you, ICRO can support you, and you can seek advice from us, and that the van will be coming in and this will definitely be phased out and hopefully completely stopped. And I wanna really honestly, I've said this behind your back, I've said it to you, I've said it so many times. I really want to... <laughs> I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking part because this film wouldn't have been the same without you. I doubt it would have had the same impact. And you, I admire your bravery and your courage so much for... Because when we were talking, I know how difficult it was for you. I know how much you pushed through. And... I really appreciate personally your contribution and you know every other girl that spoke in the film as well was extremely extremely brave but unfortunately they weren't in a position to be able to speak openly like you and you know anyway I just wanted to say thank you and that, to answer your question, that was one of our challenges. I mean, many of the girls we spoke to, that was the hardest part of finding them, speaking to so many charities who would speak to these girls, make sh mean test them, make sure they're in a um, mentally healthy, pla good place to come and speak to us. Because it is tra traumatic to speak about these things. All your life you're told to be ashamed, all your life you're told not to talk about these things, and then you have these things happen to you, and then to come and share them with a stranger and the rest of the world, it takes, it's, 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 I can't even begin to imagine how difficult it must have been for them. But um, finding those girls was very, very difficult for us, and our crew was an all-female crew. Um, we didn't even know um, many of their names, only one person in our crew knew them. We didn't even know their addresses. I didn't even see many of their faces that come with a mask. And that just goes to show how scared these people are. And getting statistics to help me show the scale of this problem was so difficult. When I was talking to the police, I was interviewing the police. We didn't even put them in in the end. There is such a fear of political correctness. There's such oversensitivity over that, that they don't even gather um, or even record these crimes, unabased crimes for what they are. And we really struggle to get that um, or to get someone to come and say the problem as it is. These were some of the main problems we had, which you know, just goes to show why this is such a problem and how widespread it is and why we don't hear about it.
there any questions from the audience? Before we start, I just want to say that, you know, Paisley is sharing her um, survivor experience, and she's here as an advocate. So um, we'll just ask you to respect her privacy when it comes to talking about her personal relationships and where she's at right now. But other than that, um, I think we, we're, we're open for questions. Hi, so, um, hello Sahar, and like, I was very lucky to work right at the start of this, but the statistics thing I think is really interesting because the same for any other aspect of women's health, there's just a lack of data, there's a lack of information, and then it's really hard to make change and push for change because, you know, people see statistics and they're well, there's not a problem because you're not showing a problem, but as you said, the police don't know how to record it, and from what I can see, even though there are experts that can record it in terms of medical procedures, um, because family members are often present, that's usually a bypass for consent, because they're so close to each other. So do you think, and kind of to both of you, like, do you think the government or other, like what else can be done to put some time into really analyzing how big this problem is, talking to medical professionals, talking to police, because you know, I, I, I'm just a bit wary because already we see with domestic violence and so many other instances that it just doesn't happen. I mean, I've got to say one thing and pass it on to Paisley. Um, so there is the oversensitivity on political correctness that makes people not s say it as it is or to you know, um, gather information or data as they should. But there is also a real lack of knowledge. And that's one thing that Paisley has been doing. Paisley is actually directly involved in training the police um, and other authorities across the country. Um, and she actually goes and teaches them, shares her experience with them and teaches them about what honor violence actually is. And I was privileged to actually follow her into one of these sessions. And it shocked me that it was a room, you know, f uh, there was maybe around 40 different police officers. And these are the people who are in charge of the department that take, uh, pick up the phone and um, take um, the details of people who call with honor-based violences. And they didn't know a lot of the things that she was saying. And of course, when they can't identify what that honor-based violence is, when that knowledge doesn't exist, then of course these things don't get recorded. Yeah, completely agree with everything Sahar was saying. Um, if professionals don't know what to look out for, then they can't, you know, they can't see somebody who needs the help. I think statistics are important, but I do think sometimes when we're trying to change things, that question comes up, well, you know, what's the proof? How many people are impacted by this? It was the exact same thing when we we're trying to advocate to ban child marriage. Mm -hmm. We were being asked by, you know, decision makers, how many children are being married? And to me, if we say one child is married as a child, that's the proof it's happening. And it means it's happening more than you know because there's no research in these issues. Professionals don't know what to look out for. Teachers don't know what to look out for. It could be right in front of them. And definitely when I was going through child marriage, I was at school here in this country. I met nurses. I went to a registry office. I walked into shops where I was being bought a wedding dress. I was a child, but nobody knew what to look out for. So if you can't see the problem, you can't record it, you can't have the statistics, but that's why the training and the awareness this needs to be a real conversation. We need to open up. It's not a taboo topic. It's not a shameful topic. This is abuse that is happening to women and girls. A ban will come in and we need to have training for teachers, for police. Everybody needs to be aware of it. The way we're talking about violence against women and girls, this is violence against women and girls and it needs to be in that conversation. And I, I really do hope that that awareness will change and you know it will become something that we're all talking about. And it shouldn't be something that charities basically manage here and there as, as much as they can. It should be a given. We're living in a multicultural society where these problems happen. And you can't, you know, Paisley is only one person. You can't expect her to go to every single police station and train everyone, hoping that they would get it. This should be a given. This should be a part of the training. We need you all to carry this conversation on. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of our training. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hello. Um, I found it very difficult um, to keep.
keep in my seat and continue to watch the program. I mean, there was a few occasions where I almost walked out. Um, how do you, as a film crew, as a team, deal with what you hear in front of you in person? I mean, forget. I mean, Paisy wasn't isn't a film film crew. She was the person who had to relive some of the worst experiences of her life in front of the world. I mean, for me, I, I, I'm even ashamed to say that, uh, that it affected me in any way when I'm sitting next to this woman. For me, I just, the fact that this film came out and it was seen and if it made one person stop and think, I, that, that does it for me. I mean, who am I? I'm so irrelevant. But then I think you're the person who is in the best place to answer that question. I think it's about having the right support. Um, obviously, these experiences are painful to relive and to talk about. Um, for me, it's really important. I work with really amazing people. One of my colleagues is here, Sarah. She's really, really amazing, always supportive, and she's always checking in with me if you know I'm emotionally okay and if I can, if I have the capacity to talk about this. So, I think that's really important. Survivor stories are very, very important in these conversations, but their well-being is also crucial because without your well-being you can't really drive that conversation and so for me um, having emotional support having people i can talk to is really really important and knowing when to sort of check out and to say this is enough i don't want to do this anymore and we did that quite a few times when we were filming so that's something that helps me get through it's never easy but we we try and, and manage these conversations the best we can because we know that the change it drives I mean, personally, for me, yeah. Um, so, question around if someone, if a female feels like they are being groomed, um, like, you know, to marry someone that they don't want to marry and have to go through this testing, what's the first thing they should do to try and get out of the situation? So, we know, so for instance, if a child is being abused, people can call uh, child services. If uh, you're being abused by someone, you can call the police perhaps. But what should someone who is going through this do? What's the first thing they should do that ensures that they don't die in the process of seeking help? Um, so the first thing, if they are in immediate danger, they need to call the police. But I think they should call ICRO if they want to seek support and advice and talk through their options. Um, forced marriage, you said, if they're being groomed to um, marry. If they are being forced to marry somebody, Ma forced marriage is illegal already, but not on account of age. Again, they should call us and we can talk to them. Hopefully, child marriage will be legal very soon, but they should definitely call ICRO and seek support. Um, that, that goes to show how important information and knowledge is, because a lot of women who go through honor-based violence and problems that you mentioned, unfortunately, they've been kind of kept in a bubble for so long and they don't really have the resources or, you know, your confidence is taken away when you're constantly told you're a tissue, you're a tissue, you know, like imagine. So a lot of the times these, from my experience of doing this film, a lot of the times th these women don't even feel like, they don't, they're not even aware of their rights and when they are they don't even feel like they deserve that help. Um, which again, I keep repeating this, but I really mean this and uh, the reason I keep saying this is because it, it's really important. That's why the type of work that charities like ICRO and you do is so important because awareness needs to be raised. If you know as a victim that what's happening to you shouldn't be happening, then you find a way out. But the problem with usually with situations like this is that they don't know what's happening to them shouldn't be happening. In fact, anecdotally, again, going back to the frustrating a point of lack of data. Anecdotally, when I was talking to different charities and from some stuff I read, um, I saw that the highest rate of suicide amongst women is amongst um, women of Muslim background in the UK um, under the age of 20, which is very telling. Just 
I think they're one, uh, you know, they're, they're one uh, organisation that need to create change or that need to allow the room for change. But I don't believe they are uh, solely responsible. I think the change needs to come from everywhere, and when I mean everywhere, I literally mean schools, um, in you know, therapy, in GPs, in education, every single place you look. This needs to be in the conversations when we're talking about rights, when we're talking about sexual health, when we're talking about violence against women and girls. Um, you know, it can start at home where parents are talking to their children about this. I believe that changes like these, because they affect society so much, it needs to be everybody. I don't believe that this particular you know, sector is, is responsible. I think it's something we're all responsible for because to me, this is violence against women and girls, and that's a conversation as a society. Every single one of us needs to be involved in men, women, children. It's so important that everyone's aware of it. Again, like I said, spotting it. Your friend might be going through it, but if you're not aware of this issue, you can't help your friend and you can't you know, flag a, an organization to them. But if you've seen, oh, I've seen on social media, for example, I are talking about this conversation, you talk to your friends about it, who talk to their siblings about it, it's just a, a thing that everyone needs to be part of that change. So to me, I wouldn't hold any soul, um, you know, uh, any soul sort of like the Muslim council or, uh, you know, teachers. I think we all need to be. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so to segue against that, like I was actually thinking that you do have this panel of three, um, like barristers, obstetricians and colleges, and as part of the healthcare professionals, like I do find it very interesting that those people talk about consent because consent is very important. You don't even need your mother to be there. You need your act. You just need yourself to be in that situation. So technically, I find it like very interesting that maybe we should actually report this to CPC or even the GNC, and also because you've been going to the pharmacies as well, the GPHRC, to make sure that this are not happening in those places. Because I find that like medical professionals, if you bring it to their attention, this will be like put under safeguarding and safety mm -hmm. and consent. And I find it so interesting that you have those three people on the panelists making sure that consent is actually the main issue. You don't need anyone in that conversation. And if someone is actually in that situation, it's an actual safeguard it's a noticeable like difference that they need to be speaking to someone else. That's that's absolutely correct. But unfortunately, you know, for us to even make this film, for us to even be able to go undercover, we had to go through a long process of proving that wrong, gathering evidence that wrongdoing is happening within these clinics, that it is in their public's interest to be able to expose that, that we can't expose it any other way but to go undercover, which is a lengthy, expensive, labor-intensive process. And it took us months to make this film to be able to just show this happening. Um, so, I mean, it shouldn't be left down to journalists like us to expose this. I think there should be a more active role in people um, and authorities making sure that the rules and regulations are being followed. Yes, I mean, I guess it's really just based off the back of what you've both been saying is, as an audience and as we're being exposed to this and, and really realizing how severe the situation actually is, obviously talking about it is one of the steps that we need to be taking in order to make a change. Is there anything else we can do as just the general public to try and help this become more widely known, more widely understood and, and actually have some sort of change? Um, I would say, I mean, you know, engaging in these conversations, but speaking to your friends, um, following the organisation's work, we often share awareness on this and we do share about social media assets. Sharing that, to me, is the best way to start the conversations and supporting the organisations who are carrying this work and helping and supporting the women and girls impacted. Yeah, uh, yeah brilliant film, uh, firstly, really uh, enlightening. Um, you mentioned, it kind of relates a little bit to one of the previous questions actually, how do we kind of go about fixing this? And I think maybe internationally, 
is there a vehicle or an institution that can help kind of drive that change? You mentioned WHO and you know being a violation of human rights. Are there any other countries in the world that have outlawed it, or are we the first? Yeah, no. Um, this was actually outlawed in um, um, France, um, and some other countries are looking into banning it but it's still happening pretty much everywhere. And just think how bad it is here. Imagine how bad it is in places like Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Lebanon, Lebanon in so many other, in, this is also very prevalent in Canada, in the US. And this is an issue I found when I was pitching it. Um, I mean, I'm so glad that I pitched it to ITV, Tom Giles, like just got it, but so many people just because they haven't heard of it or they think that it affects a very niche community, it's not important enough or big enough to pay attention to it. What they don't understand is that it's actually affecting a very, very big population and it's a population that needs their voices heard the most because they're invisible. Yeah. I guess there's been lots of talk about how this is educating and informing girls that this is, you know, this is a violation to you, this is your human rights. This ori originates and comes from the group, this comes from the groom and the groom's family. Where is the any sort of pushback? Is there anything that comes up to say, the groom, this is just pulling it from the root cause of where all this is stemming from? Is there anything coming up to educating the men, the grooms, that are saying, this isn't acceptable, this isn't what you're meant to do, like push back to the family tradition, challenge back on it. It's not only just the females who push back, when it comes from the significance of the male family and, and the notions that we're looking at, the males always dominate and take like a higher precedence in the family like tree, effectively. So effect, like just educating both males is that something that we're seeing as a drive? Is this something that we're getting a little bit more visibility on? Um, I think it's definitely something as an organization, we, we do believe that everyone should be part of this conversation and men are absolutely a, you know, a very important audience that need to understand the harms and need to be listening to how this is affecting women and girls. It's the same with you know, child marriage, FGM. All this comes down to is how it makes a man feel and you know it's, it's part of his ego that's the the whole idea of honor based abuse the woman is treated or the girl is treated a certain way so that it upkeeps his honor and his family's honor you know that's what it all comes down to so when i say everyone needs to be part of this conversation i believe and definitely the organization believe we need to be talking about the harms and we need to make sure that the demand is not there so that the harm is not there for the women and girls. And I definitely personally believe that men should be involved in this conversation, but it's about how do you open up these conversations in a safe way and how do you make sure that the message reaches? Because you, you want to make sure you open up that space and actually have a productive conversation. And that's something that I really hope with, with the ban happening and you know conversations starting. I, I don't feel like it's something that can just you know, like anything else can happen overnight where we go and have conversations, we get men in a, in a room and just start talking to them about this. I think it's small steps, but definitely I think it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think in all sorts of gender-based violence, whether it's rape, domestic violence, whatever, it's important to educate women and inform them of their rights or, you know, this shouldn't be happening to you, and that's happening a lot. But a lot of the times, men and young and boys are not being educated as much as they should be. I mean, even, even within our families, our mom and dads are telling us, don't wear that skirt, it's too short, or be careful which alleyway you go to. Even when, you know, somebody to this day ends up getting raped or whatever on the street, they're like, oh, well, she was drunk and she was walking on the street, she was asking for it. You know, that, that mentality still exists, and we certainly need, that, that, that shouldn't be there. And, um, you know, men are the other part of this, the big part of this. And yes, as women, we should be protecting ourselves, but the men certainly need to be educated, especially from a young age. Do you, that's I'm gonna sure. just, do you think that's happening now a little more, you know, with the Sarah Everard murder, that, you know, people are now sort of thinking, well, no, it's, she has every right to walk home, right, whenever she wants and feel safe. 
you know, so even at, at, at that level, do you think that we are starting to have that conversation that it's, no, you know, it, it's, women have the right to be safe wherever they go, whatever time it might be. Um, and maybe that's just the beginning, but do you feel like that might be, there may be a shift? I think so, yeah. I think we're definitely talking a lot more about, you know, not, not necessarily, the messaging is not necessarily women should protect themselves. No, we don't need to protect ourselves. We should feel safe in any space that we go into. And the behavior that makes us feel unsafe needs to stop. It's not about us protecting ourselves, it's about that stopping. So I do think the conversation is shifting and I think it's, it's you know, change that will happen. It just takes a long time, but it's about, we spoke about um, school and boys. Boys of today are obviously going to grow up and be young men one day. It's really important that in schools we're talking about these issues so that from a young age, they understand you cannot treat anybody, first of all, but especially women, you cannot control women, you cannot tell them what to do with their bodies, and you should allow women to feel safe in any space they go into. So to me, the school, that's one of the most important places for this to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. Yeah. Yes. Um, just, just to highlight the importance that you raised about the, what can happen after the law is banned, uh, so we learned from France, actually, they banned um, first the virginity test, not the hymen of mm -hmm. And we found that it wasn't really effective. So this was a good example that we learned from there. I just want to explain, share one thing. Being, in, being a gynecologist myself and treated to reverse the MTM. So two years ago, uh, before pandemic, and I was coming with my family to um, Dubai. And I saw a young girl of seven years old or so. The way she was crying and the way she was holding her legs, I had a feeling that could have been somewhere where she had the FGM and returning home. And she was actually on my flight. And all through the flight she was crying. She was given some drinks by the parents. And I didn't like it. But that is what I'm saying. FGM being banned in this country. I failed to explain that to the, um, the cabin crew. What is that? Actually, one of the guy actually wrote down what is that AFGM means. And then I said, you need to keep an eye. And they said, no, sorry, we cannot do that. This is another um, passenger. Then I asked the cabin to the, the head of that, and they said, we will inform it when we go down. Nobody did anything. I went to the immigration because um, the, the guy who was standing there said, I've got something to inform you. Yeah and about FGM, they had no idea what is FGM. Then I said, can I talk to somebody senior? So that is while I'm in the queue. And I can see them standing there, and the girl is there. And then the head of the immigration office at that time was a woman. So I went and explained, and she thanked me. She said, well, thank you for highlighting it. And I said, look, I'm a gynecologist myself, and I operate. I, I don't like the way she's walking and the way she's crying. You need to check it. They were out of the immigration before I managed to get out. They did not do anything. While a professional raising concern that somebody needs to examine her, because I'm not allowed to do that at that point, they said we have a team. I don't know what happened. We were in the outside the airport, and I could see them going out, even they came out before me. So I don't know this how education, I think we really need to talk to, I mean, this is a woman standing there who understands what is FGM. And this is a gynecologist, a consultant telling her I'm not happy. They, they were left, they said we keep the details. So with this one, I think we have to do a lot of work. <laughs> and I just don't know how it works. I mean, all, all I know, I'm, I'm very proud that England has done it, but I know what will happen. You pay 3,000 pounds at Harley Street, you pay 2,000 pound, you get it down in Lebanon. You can get it down in Turkey. You take a flight, get it done, come back cheaper than Harley Street. We know that has been happening. So I don't think it is going to stop unless really the whole society, and I think that you will be busier now <laughs> than before. <laughs> Because I believe the ban out. carries um, the extraterritorial aspect, meaning that if a girl is taken out of the country for the purposes of virginity testing or hymenoplasty, it is still a crime. Um, I think yeah, Sarah, 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 yeah, that's right. We, so we've got really.
hard for the actual territorial effects. But it, it does also apply to FPM. So the reality of actually implementing something is obviously really difficult, but we definitely, we fought for that. And also good news that the ban will apply across all four nations. And that was a real push too. Um, and the child marriage was <laughs> one of our complications with that. It's officially called and so on. Um, but yeah, that's the way to go. You need to join up the dots. Um, so it will get to trouble. I will agree with you though, there is a lot of work to be done and you know, it's something uh, I personally and the work we're doing at IPRO, we are really pushing to make sure and to continue to talk about <coughs> the education and the training. When we say professionals, we're not just saying doctors and you know, uh, teachers. This has to be something that everyone is aware of and everyone is you know, thinking about and talking about. It's not one of those things that you want to pick up in any certain setting because it's it's heartbreaking to hear the story that you told if that professional the first one in on the plane had been aware of this topic they could have actually saved that girl from you know further traumatic um, experience of course she's already been through something traumatic by your um, suspicion but they could have supported her and you know stopped it from going further and also here we've been talking about you know, authorities taking an active stance against these kinds of abusers and men taking an active stance, um, especially from certain communities where these things are uh, very common. And Ashfaq Khan is, I, I just want to thank you here in front of everybody, is somebody who's been doing that. He's from a Bangladeshi background and as a gynecologist from Harley Street, he's been He's not a campaigner, he's a gynecologist, but he's been campaigning against virginity testing, hymenoplasty, FGM, and other forms of um, surgeries and procedures similar to these for years. He's been quoted in many, many articles. He kindly took part in our film, and he's had many patients going up to him, asking him for the procedure, and he's been outright refusing. And he was very, very helpful in the process of making our film. And to take us back to the question you asked earlier, Melissa, you said, would a ban actually make a difference? Prior to the ban, people, I mean, Ashfaq Khan could tell you more himself, but prior to the ban, people would go up to him and ask for um, either a virginity test or a hymenoplasty, and he'd refuse and say, morally, I don't feel right, go to someone else. But he had somebody last week uh, from Manchester, and he just said no it's illegal. I advise you don't do it because it's a criminal offence. Okay. Um, I had a question. As a journalist, what are the risks that you face going undercover and showing the actual faces of people that uh, work uh, as doctors or pharmacists? That was my question. I mean, as a journalist, uh, my priority, the reason I do what I do, the reason I live, is to try to make the world that little bit better by exposing things that need to be exposed. And if you were to put anyone at risk, I might as well not be doing what I'm doing. We're doing this um, for the reasons I just mentioned. Like I said earlier, going undercover is a very long procedure with the channel to start with. I mean, we have to, um, going undercover is always the absolute last resort. We have to basically be talking to the lawyers of the channel, several lawyers. Um, we have to first gather evidence that um, wrongdoing is taking place at X, Y, and Z place, and that um, we, if we expose that, it would be in the, pub, in the interest of the public, and that we can't expose it in any other way. And we have to convince the lawyers of that and then do it. And we would absolutely not do it if we didn't think we would be exposing wrongdoing. Or, you know, if, if we hadn't exposed the people doing, if we hadn't exposed the people we're exposing this, like um, that lady over there said, they would have never been investigated by um, the authorities. It's, but it's the absolute last resort, and that's the reason films like this are so expensive, labor-intensive, and difficult to make. Did you run into any problems when you went to them for comment? I mean, after after you you know because <laughs> obviously you had to um, tell Dr. Horn that he was filmed, and you know 
Yeah, I mean, annoyingly, <laughs> um, the lawyers, I mean, they would never respond directly. They all have lawyers. Right, right. And the lawyers of these people have, the media lawyers, have learned a trick that if they wait until the very last minute, very close to the broadcast, it would really mess up with our sleep and with our processes and they, it would just make it a bit more difficult. I mean, we didn't hear back from Dr. Horn until I think a day before the broadcast of the film. <laughs> they really leave it until last minute and then they respond with some irrelevant comments. Yeah, absolutely, loads of problems. But then at the end of the day, we have to do our job right. And we did give them a deadline. We said, if you want your comments to be in it, a right to reply, um, here is your chance you have until this date. They did take a very long time. It's difficult. But no one said this job was easy, right? <laughs> no. evaluate the people who ask about the, the dignity of the women, whether they are leaders, imam, or whatever. Today, in Iran, as you know, the news speaking about Kathleen. You know who's Kathleen, no? Kathleen, she is a British journalist, and went to Iran uh, as if she became Muslim and Shia, and she wore hijab, became new very to Ayatollah Khamenei, or Isi, and other leaders. And yesterday she wrote an article in Israeli news that she was a spy for Israel against Iran. And all the leaders, like Ayatollah Khamenei and Raisi, want sex with her. So those people who ask virginity, they do the dirty work. And you know here, even the Imam of Central Mosque, it has written in uh, Guardians that uh, four women ask the court, he raped them in inside the mosque. So those people who ask uh, virginity, even whether they are imam, leaders, they do the dirty work. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I do apologize if you already covered this in the documentary. I wanted to ask about your organization and the resources or procedures you have in place. So I can understand that a lot of females who are in the situation and want to reach out are too scared to do it because if they get caught while still living at home it can you know be disastrous for them if somebody does reach out to you and you can from what they are telling you it is a very dangerous situation and they have to get out how can you help them or get them out of the situation or what resources do you have where you can't involve the police because if the police do knock on the door instantly the limelight will be on them. I mean, speaking from situations I have seen, um, how do you go about that? What resources do you have if, if the police are a no-go? If your organization physically knocking on the door is a no-go, how, how do you get them out safely and what can you do for them going forward? Um, so the resources, firstly, I don't offer for this counseling. Um, we, we have a refuge as well. Um, we offer different sorts of uh, support. But in, if there was a situation and someone said to us that they're at risk, the first thing is, for them to contact us, they have to do it safely. That is my first advice to anyone who's at risk. Because, um, like you say, sometimes they will be monitored or they'll be in situations where they won't be safe contacting. But they can email or they can call or they can um, text the numbers that we have on our website. If somebody is in real danger, so ICRO would work with the police if obviously somebody needed to come out of their home. But it would be all about actually discussing how that can be done. Because I've seen in my, in my sister's experience, the police knocked at a door. That was her chance of actually seeking safety. But because my parents were at home, she couldn't answer the door and speak to them, so she sent the police away. So any situation like that, we would never want to make the situation worse. So I crow if they sense someone is in danger, obviously the police are the first point of contact. But if we're in communication with someone who needs our support, we wouldn't just send the police around to make it worse. It's about finding how that person will actually get to our services in the safest way. For example, if they're going to college, whether they can 
see a professional there and organize a form of contact, but it will always be our main priority to make sure the person gets the support safely. So we'd we'll be talking through the options and never ever trying to make the situation worse because we know where there's on a base violence happening, the police just turning up can very often make situations worse. At the same time, if somebody is in great danger, you know, you can't just leave that person in danger. So you really need to assess the situation individually and very, very closely. I don't know if Sarah wants to add anything to that. Yeah, no, you'd always make a, like a bespoke plan for, for that person um, and think about their safety. And yeah, in terms of resources, I mean, we need more, <laughs> we need more resources. Um, yeah, I, I'm the odd one out, I, I otherwise it's a fine for organisation, um, doing amazing work, speaking all of the key languages, Middle Eastern, North African, um, and Afghan um, diaspora. And yeah, so refuge, counselling, advice and advocacy, working in schools, campaigning to change the law. It's very much a holistic approach to trying to kind of tackle the whole the whole picture. Um, but yeah, we've there have been some really quite ingenious situations of how you might try and get to somebody and get messages. But I would say that the pandemic created so many difficulties because people were being that they you know, people who were, we were in contact with suddenly were being surveyed so much more, often by multiple perpetrators potentially um, and also I think there'll be a long impact from all the people who might have found out about, uh, about us through um, a teacher or GP or that kind of thing all those interactions have not been face to face for such a long time until you know often GP appointments go on the phone so there's a lot less opportunities for people to have those conversations um, so we not, we need to be that much more vigilant to be able to reach out to people and and talk to people. So do you do you work with centres where you can house anybody who needs to get out immediately, um, or do you do you have your own? We have our own. Yeah. You have your own. Okay. But we also work. I mean, so we have our own. We have eight beds. We're trying to expand that, um, but we obviously work with a whole kind of network of organisations. Often people will need to be house nowhere near where they are so yeah it's about working together thank you so your story was your mother telling you it was a, a tissue metaphor is it also being taught in mosques synagogues schools are people getting like formally educated that they need to protect their virginity I mean, I can only speak from my own experience. When I was in Iran, for example, we were taught it from, I mean, before, like I said, before I even knew what sex was, from year one in schools, we were told how important it is to be pure and to wear the hijab and cover ourselves to not tempt men. Um, I mean, we were taught this in, Quran lessons and Islamic lessons, but I don't know about here. Obviously, um, these honor and things like this are more ingrained. And actually, I asked you this question. I was like, how how we because you had it so much. Y y your upbringing was a lot more strict than mine was, um, and I asked you this question, and you said, well, um, we weren't even allowed to like sit. sit cross leg when we had male guests for example you were you, maybe maybe you're in a better position to answer that question how these things are communicated like that they're ingrained inside of your head in a way that you don't even th that area of your body is so taboo you it, it's just such a shame to even think about it let alone discuss it you just know that you just don't go there i mean you you put it a lot more delicately than i did than i did just now um so from my experience and the women in the was like in my family, extended family and what I've seen, it starts at home and yeah. it starts from a very, very young age and there will be small things that are said to you from around five, six, I mean in my own experience that's how it happened, it was all about not playing with boys, not physically um, interacting in a certain way, so not sitting in a position, not opening my legs, not riding a bike because I was told um, that if you ride a bike, you will break your virginity. So it's all of these things. Um, I do believe it, it starts from the home and it just continues in the home. 
and there are all these moments in your life that this idea of purity and virginity and protecting your virginity are just constantly um, reinforced in you and to do that would be the very worst thing in your life and you're always reminded of the consequences not having your virginity would mean you know the worst thing for your family would mean that you don't get married and how could you possibly not get married that that would just you know that's the impossible um and then of course to me like the way i view it it's all of these things that lead up to the ultimate test of having your virginity test which is you know very closely linked with a forced or a child marriage a fgm so all these things like sahar was saying before they're all connected so if you think about it it starts you have FGM and, and you know we all know the reason that girls are having to go under um, FGM and then you're being told about your physical body and how much shame it carries and then you have to prove your virginity and then you have to you know you go into this system of once you've proven your virginity you're now in a forced marriage you probably will have a forced pregnancy and it just continues it's almost like a pattern of things and it never ends but that one point the virginity testing it's the main event it's the test of your life ultimately as a woman or gal yeah. okay i think that's it for questions i just have one more for both of you what is next is there if you were going to do a part two um what would that look like um and how hard might that be to to make given the challenges you already had I mean, there are so many different issues that I want to cover. Um, one of the things that I learned in the process of making this film was um, literally the month, the last month of the production, I realized that two men who committed an act of honor killing were actually being released from, re from prison. In this country, um, you don't get a life sentence. It's very rare, I think and you you know however many years you're given if you're at good behavior you can come out earlier and you know honor killing became a thing in early 2000s as a result of your sister being murdered actually that that played a big part in that actually becoming a part of the legislation so a lot of a few people were actually imprisoned in um because of um honor killings so-called honor killings well honor um and a lot of them were actually starting to come out of prisons um, and I don't know how that's right. That's actually putting a lot of the people within families had to actually go and testify, testify against these people and putting them in prison and it, it, they're going to be put in danger for with these people coming out. So that it's, it's, it's very, it's a very sensitive thing. I don't know if I'll ever even manage to make this, but if there was one thing I could do before I die and it would make me feel happy is to make a film to shine the light on that because how is that okay? How is that okay? How is that protecting anyone? How is that actually um, ending such a horrendous problem? Well, Sorry, I, 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 I think you can tell I really struggled to say no, that. I, I hope you get to make it. Um, really, uh, I look forward to, to watching it. Daisy, any last words? Um, question, your question, what's next? The band comes in, um, we're all talking about this, it's wide knowledge, um, iCrow is supporting anyone who's impacted by this, you're donating to the amazing work iCrow does, and um, I don't know what we'll work on next, I guess implementing child marriage and the training and education, all of that stuff, so I think that's next for us. Well, I want to thank you for your courage and your bravery, Daisy, and Sahar for your tenacity and just your hard work. Thank you. So, it was a team, and thank team you effort. everybody for just being so <laughs>